Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Today we will discuss Egypt's regional standing in the midst of significant changes, which we will touch on during our program. With me in the studio to discuss this topic are Dr. Iran Lerman, who is a research fellow at Vesa Center for Strategic Studies. Welcome. Yeah. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analysis, uh, analyst, sorry, Amir Oren. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome Mr. Tzvi Mazel, former Israeli ambassador to Egypt, as well as a research fellow at the Jerusalem Center for Public yes, Affairs. Yes. Welcome. And I'd like to uh, give you the opportunity to give us a little bit of an understanding. There have been significant changes, but also many changes uh, just recently uh, when it comes to Egypt, things that may also have some implications on Israel and other countries in the region. Please. Many changes, but one constant. Egypt is a very strong military power. It has not been put to the test recently, except in the Sinai, but it is considered perhaps the most potent Arab military power, but a very weak economic power, uh, too many um, mouth to feed, and problems with human rights. But all in all, President Sisi is doing his best and is entitled to be supported by the United States and other countries, because the alternative is not only worse, it is going to be chaotic. Uh, Dr. Lehmann, when it comes to Egypt uh, or the Middle East at large, one key factor that always is very significant for the Middle East is the honor of the people, uh, the honor of the nations. Uh, people put a lot of weight onto that. And one of the things that just happened uh, in the past uh, couple of weeks, and it's been an endeavor that happened already for years and years, Egypt has decided to transfer or give a return. Uh, return. Frankly, return. Uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, Mr. Mazel might think differently about that, but um, return two islands, Tiran and Sanafir, which are significant uh, of strategic value uh, not only for Egypt, but also for other countries in the region, including Israel, including Jordan. Isn't this a sense of, okay, we're giving this up because we're indeed in such an economic distress, as Mr. Oren just put, that we're willing to give us our, uh, give up our honor for something like this? I wouldn't put it that way, although I'm certain that the Muslim Brotherhood and some of uh, Sisi's critics are very happy to jump all of a sudden on, on the national wagon and, and make this a, a national and a question of national honor. You see, the reason the Brotherhood was driven from power, the deepest reason, is uh, one uh, Egyptian, uh, while Nawara put it very nicely back then, he said, it's the Egyptian identity, stupid. It's, it's al Hawi al Masriya. They felt that the Brotherhood is giving away Egypt's distinct identity. So now the Brotherhood is very happy to uh, repay Sisi with the same coin. But at the end of the day, I think uh, we understood exactly where this is coming to when uh, uh, Mohammed Ben Salman was in Cairo a year ago and uh, Article 6 of the Cairo Declaration said that they are going to discuss border issues. There's only one border issue between the two countries. The islands were Saudi uh, unquestionably until 1949. Um, there's no question about the sovereignty. Egypt, they were uh, transferred to the custody of Egypt on the assumption that Egypt would be better positioned to use them against Israel than Saudi Arabia, which at the time had practically no navy. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the story. So they, their, their strategic significance is relevant only if you have a quarrel with Israel. Mm -hmm. If you do not have a quarrel with Israel, they are good for bird watchers. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Mazel, this is... Uh some uh, key value, uh, key um, reasons behind the story. And, and there's been also a period of time between 1932, since the inception, basically, of uh, the Saudi Arabia under the, the family of Saud uh, until 49, which those islands were part of Saudi Arabia. Now it has shifted since then to Egypt, since its historic... Uh, connection to those islands from the 15th century and beyond have been very uh, solid to a certain extent, of course. But this, uh, this significance is more about what it actually means. Egypt wasn't willing to pass those islands for years and years. Now it has. What is the core of this reason? 
Well, it's, I, I think it's, we just heard here a, what is this, I can define as a conventional wisdom. This is right, but it's not the whole story because it, uh, one should, uh, shouldn't forget the fact is that uh, Saudi Arabia did not exist before 32. So in the last 500 years, it belonged to Egypt because there was a, 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 an Arab peninsula, but it was not governed by stable uh, rulers, you see. Once in 32, uh, Saudi Arabia came into being, they joined all maritime convention, United Nations, whatever, so, and they tried to claim it. But it was part of Egypt uh, during a very long time, and especially uh, they, they came to knew it, right? the Egyptians during the wars with Israel, because in 67 it was casus belli for Israel, you see? And it still remains a casus belli, because if now Saudi Arabia, it's not yet in the hands of Saudi Arabia, because it has not, the agreement has not been ratified so far by the parliament. In the parliament there, are, there is a lot of position, but it will pass, I think so. The problem is that there are two points. First of all, Egypt in, in, in 1977, uh, uh, 78, 79, when we discussed peace, we signed peace, Egypt knew it was not Egyptian anymore because anyway, the Saudis were reclaiming it, claiming it, okay? Still- Based they, on the maritime international law where yes, it's just uh, no, a matter of proximity to land? It, you, you, have, you have a few, um, a few factors. The, first of all, history. History counts. History of 500 years, it has something to say. You see? Then a, a Egyptian died for it. They died for it. You see? It's, it, it was part of their land. They studied about uh, Sanafir and Tiran in school. Uh, Nasser, I, I have two recordings saying Nasser in 57 and 67. This is Sanafir and uh, Tiran are 100% Egyptian. We will never let uh, Israeli ships go uh, through to, uh, to Eilat. This is what you are saying. And then they, they walked uh, one day, one morning, and it, uh, the government told them, no, it's absolutely not ours. And the problem is that in Egypt, the, the, the holiness of the, the earth is so important. This is one thing, the honor. And then there is two, two clauses. A, a, a clause number one, the constitution. Mm -hmm. Egypt is indivisible and you cannot give away part of the, uh, the uh, country. And then uh, clause 151, I think, also the same thing repeated. And you need a lot of, uh, you need a referendum for it. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complicated issue. I, I would just like, a moment. May, may, may I, may just, may a I moment. just interject? Yeah. Just a moment. Uh, it will be the last uh, sentence. Please. If it goes, passes, in the hands to, of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is still an enemy country, whatever. Even now, if we have some interests in common, they remain mm -hmm. anti-Israeli. They hate the Jews. Wahhabism is really the, the, the most terrible system, uh, Muslim system against Jews. So we have, we have a problem here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would like to take one step backwards. Uh, Amir, could you give us an understanding of where are they actually and what does it actually mean, uh, this move from one country to another, and also what it means for Israel? Let me start by uh, being anecdotal rather than analytic. Having grown up in a lot between the wars of 1956 and 1967, when the uh, Elat harbor was opened for traffic, because earlier it was just a small port, one could have seen the importance of the maritime route from the east uh, for Israel, for oil, mostly from Iran, Iran. as well as for other shipping. However, um, in 1949, Israel took over what was then called Um Rashrash. The port of Elat, as well as most of the Negev, was not part of the Jewish state under the 1947 partition resolution, but because the other side did not recognize it and open war, Israel took it by force and started a lot, which is why the Saudi-Egyptian transaction went into being. Earlier, there was no point in having these islands. They, they uh, were used, as Iran said, for bird watching. Now, having said that, after 1973, they have lost their significance for several reasons. First of all, even when Israel ruled all of Sinai, the Egyptians managed to mine the other straits on the other side, Milan and Yuval, for, for shipping. But even more so, Babel Mandeb, the southernmost 
straight became the choking point. There was no, and Israel uh, did not, was not fast enough in sending its missile boats around the Cape of Good Hope, which it intended to do uh, before the uh, war started. So if you control Bab el Mandeb, or if you control Yemen or Aden, you control the Straits of Tehran too. By the way, Israel also tried to call it the Gulf of Shlomo, Gulf of Solomon. And this particular dispute reminds one of the Shaba farms. Are they Syrian or are they Lebanese? In any event, they are not Israel. Mm -hmm. so, so, so in any event, Israel, Israel has agreed to this transaction now. And um, a stable Egypt is more important for Israel strategically than whoever is control of these uh, islands. Dr. Well, well, moreover, uh, it's true that in the 1979 treaty, there is reference to uh, the freedom of navigation. But this is only in the sense that Egypt undertakes not to contravene international law uh, in, the, in pursuit of its conflict with Israel. Uh, when they closed the straits for Israeli navigation, they were breaking international law. You may remember that the, the ultimate trigger for our decision to go to war in 67 was not simply that they closed the straits, but that the uh, Johnson administration failed to put together this well, the so-called regatta of international uh, uh, maritime powers that would have legally been uh, very much within their rights had they sailed through the straits and shown the Egyptians that they were breaking the law. I find it very difficult to imagine under any circumstances that Saudi Arabia, given the magnitude of the challenges they face and their place and our place and Egypt's place in the game of camps in the region, with Iran uppermost in their mind and our mind. In fact, we are trying to drag the Egyptians to that position. The Egyptians read the same list of enemies, but upside down. It's, for us, it's Iran, IS, Muslim Brotherhood. For the Egyptians, it's the same list, but in the reverse order. Mm -hmm. But in any case, we all face the same set of enemies. To, to try to, to, for me, it's unimaginable that the Saudis would confront the world, not to mention the military capabilities of Israel, in order to close what is up, no, without question an international waterway. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mazel, is this, it, I, I would like to understand, though, from you, with regarding, uh, you've stated about the Wahhaba family and the, the Muslim uh, ideals within this uh, constellation school, which uh, doesn't, Islam, uh, doesn't sympathize Islam. with uh, the Jewish people or with the Jewish state. Uh, nonetheless, uh, what we hear from Dr. Lerman is that in this circumstances of uh, Iran now receiving this uh, nuclear agreement which has brought about many opportunities for it in the region, with the Islamic State posing a, a key danger to so many countries in the region, including uh, Saudi Arabia, including also uh, Egypt, which is dealing with Wilayat Sina, the uh, Sinai district of yes. the Islamic State. We see so many uh, various aspects. Is the, the uh, statement of the enemy of uh, my enemy is indeed my friend come also into play here? Not always in the Middle East. Now, we, you know, most of the alliances in the Middle East are completely blood. You don't understand who is what. Uh, Iran and Turkey, uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Egypt, they, they don't have the same interest on every issue. They still manage to find a kind of a comp compromise, but really not many people understand what's going on. Even themselves don't understand. Now, we speak about the Middle East, not about the European Union. If, if uh, at the time being, at the time being, it is true that from the point of view of Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, Gulf countries, and Israel, we are in the same camp, but it's only under the table. It cannot be open. So far, uh, Saudi Arabia does not let even our uh, planes uh, fly to the, to the east and cross its air, airspace. You didn't mention Egypt. Egypt is not part Just of this? Egypt is part of it, absolutely. It is right that Egypt at that time, you know, being friendly with Russia, is not exactly on the same wavelengths about, about Syria, uh, whether Assad will remain or not remain in the first phase, but it's not very important. Both of the Sunni country, countries and Israel behind the scene are against Iran, so they collaborate. But tomorrow, after tomorrow, after tomorrow, five, six, seven years, or even, even before, it can split. 
and we'll find ourselves in, a, in such a position that Saudi Arabia, our worst enemy, it will be our worst enemy because of the religion, because of basic Islam, uh, hostility toward the Jews in Israel, it will have the, the, the hand on the, 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 the going out into Asia for Israel on commercial uh, issues. Asia, Australia, and Africa. It's a fact. You cannot deny it because we don't have a peace treaty with Saudi Arabia. You, you can console yourself and tell, and tell yourself, yeah, it, now it's okay. It will never happen. Still, it happened. And if something had happened, it will, it will happen in the future. But, so we should be cautious. Just a moment. We, have, we must, I don't know how, it's a big problem to change the peace treaty. It's not a joke because the peace treaty it was signed by Egypt, and now it's not belongs. It not it's going not to be to be belong any, anymore to Egypt or another. So don't take it very very easily lightly. It, it's a problem. It's a strategical problem. Maybe. Should we uh, we be? Of course, we should be cautious. But is there some optimism within that caution? And uh, back in the fifties, when Saudi Arabia did reach out to Israel, there have been certain aspects where Israel and Egypt uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia, sorry, had some kind of uh, interest uh, aligned one to one. Currently, we're seeing also a new reality where also Prime Minister Bimi Netanyahu on several occasions is talking about reproachment. He doesn't specifically say Saudi Arabia, but he does point all fingers that direction. Yes, of course. Um, the only uh, strategic uh, base or rear, depends on how you look at it, uh, Israel has is in the Gulf, led by Saudi Arabia, but in also including Oman and other uh, uh, countries there. Now, Saudi Arabia is very weak, exposed, vulnerable. Ariel Sharon used to say, or at least uh, they used to subscribe to him, uh, the saying, the Saudis have the oil, but we have the match to light it up. Now, Israel shouldn't threaten Saudi Arabia, but uh, uh, the fact that Israel fought the Reagan administration over the AWOX plane to Saudi Arabia, just a warning and control uh, system, not the fighter plane, then the F-15s, and they have it in Tabuk, which is uh, mm -hmm. not, not a very long uh, flight from Israel, but uh, they are also exposed. They don't have an interest, and you know, the, all the prophecies regarding the fall of the House of Saud, uh, we have been hearing for, for decades, all the other countries have fallen by the wayside, the regimes uh, were replaced, the uh, House of Saud is still there. Uh, King Salman, is uh, one of the 25 uh, sons or so of um, the late, perhaps great, Ibn Saud. Um, so uh, Israel should not fear Saudi Arabia. Israel should do its utmost for its own best interests in order to have peace. And once Israel has peace with the Palestinians, the Saudis will fall in line too. But and not the, about the legal and, issue. Another, another point. Well, Israel, when Israel signed the peace treaty with Egypt, it was also in control of Gaza, and therefore the Egyptians insisted on dividing Rafa between Egypt and yes. the uh, Palestinian, the Israeli-controlled Palestine. But one more, uh, additional point regarding the Straits of Tehran is that Israel is now navigating the Suez Canal. The, the entire rationale behind the uh, uh, maritime route to Eilat was because Israel was barred from using the Suez Canal. Had Israel used the canal back in the 50s, uh, it may not uh, have even uh, developed uh, Eilat. So the Suez have Canal and the islands were controlled by Egypt. Oh, yes, of course. So, so things have changed. Dr. Lerman. For the yeah. better. Look, um, there's, there's an, another player looming on the horizon if we're talking in strategic terms. Um, the term one belt, one road, the Chinese concept of going either overland or by sea, uh, establishing closer connect uh, economic connections with Europe, involves both the Suez Canal as the main choke point, but also a keen interest in navigation, of course, all along the Red Sea, and specifically also the use of both Eilat and Aqaba potentially uh, as, as uh, an added element in, in the larger equation. I, the Chinese will not I, look uh, in a friendly way to any country that interferes with the freedom of navigation under law in the uh, Red Sea as a whole. So I, I really think we should not paint uh, uh, dark shadows on, on the walls right now. Uh, when I talk to my students in Shalem or Tel Aviv, I 
what is an interest? An interest is an elegant word, which means that we have the same enemies. Mm -hmm. And right now, and for the foreseeable future, I don't see Iran you know, uh, disappearing from the equation in the uh, intermediate future. Mm -hmm. um, we and Saudi Arabia... So you count on the enemy, you count on the enemy. <laughs> well, we did, we always did. Why, why did we have some kind of under the blanket uh, groping <laughs> with the Saudis in the 50s? Because we were afraid of the same man. Gamal Nasser. Abdel Nasser. No. Yes. And, uh, and uh, nowadays it's, it's Iran. It's much more overt. Mm -hmm. Uh, remember, the Saudi Arabia goes, uh, what the Saudis do silently, the UAE does in a, in a vocally. rather loud, vocally. Yeah. And the UAE is pretty open about uh, the need to have a, not a normalized, but a practical relationship. Mm -hmm. But there's also another element, the common neighbor of Saudi Arabia and Israel, Jordan. And Jordan and uh, Saudi Arabia used to have a common enemy, Iraq. Mm -hmm. And the interests are uh, identical uh, in the Egyptian, Saudi, Jordanian Israeli rectangle, you can see uh, almost an identity of interest. Touching yes, on you know, that, I, I would like actually to uh, hear from you, Mr. Mazel. Uh, we're talking also about a lot of agreements being signed between King uh, Salman yes. currently in this trip uh, yes. with the Egyptians. One of the big uh, agreements was $60 billion uh, in uh, development for the Sinai uh, uh, region, That's as right. well as a bridge, a bridge that will connect between Egypt and Saudi Arabia, which, in other words, cuts uh, Israel as well as Jordan out of the loop if they're interested. It will connect the two nations and leave those two countries out of the loop. How do you see this happen? Uh, does this actually mm -hmm. signal to Israel that you will stay out of the equation mm -hmm. of reproachment to the Arab world as long as you don't do what we want? Or is there mm -hmm. some kind That's of other significance to it? Absolutely. I think that once the, uh, both countries, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, decided to, uh, to build a bridge uh, not, and not going through, uh, through Israel, because Egypt, like, uh, a bridge like that is about a 20, minimum 27, between 27 and 30, 35 kilometers. Mm. It's a many, many billions of dollars. They don't have it. They, really, they don't have it, especially now with the uh, uh, petrol uh, uh, prices down. Uh, they prefer not to go through Israel. And they can't go through, uh, uh, through Israel. It's very easy. They can't build through Israel. It's a very short uh, uh, strip in, in a highway and the railways. It will be very, very cheap. But once they have said to go together and to not to go to Israel, it means that they don't believe that there will be peace between Israel and the Arabs in general in the coming years. And they prefer to put it away, to, to forget about Israel. I think from the psychological point of view and from ethic and moral point of view, it's very, very bad. But that because, option still see, remains on the table if we listen Sadat to... Wanted, Sadat wanted Nonetheless, to but this. Foreign Minister Samir Shoukri has stated uh, very uh, uh, decisively that Egypt will put its eggs in different baskets rather than just one basket. Yeah. How do you I, view yeah, that? I, I fail to see... Um, why Ambassador Mazel is so bewildered at the Egyptian and Saudi policies. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his uh, key ministers go on and on about the belief that they have that in their lifetime there will not be peace. Mm -hmm. Taken at face value, the Arab leaders say either Israel does not, is not willing to pay the price, or for some other reason there will be no peace in the uh, foreseeable future. So should we wait until something happens or should we work on it and build something which is uh, around the uh, causeway to Key West in Florida? Also another consideration. If Egypt collapses and millions of, of Egyptians go away outside of the country, will all of them go to Europe or will some of them flood Saudi Arabia. This is an interest, and in Saudi interest, to keep, to keep uh, uh, Egypt from failing. Dr. Norman. Actually, I want to put this whole proposition on its head. Uh, in the 50s, the need to cut is through the Negev for the Arab world, for Arab, some kind of uh, ability to, of the Maghreb or the Arab West to be connected with the Arab East, could only go through 
uh, carving up the negative. If you know, if you know in, the, in the Alpha plan and in all sorts of negotiations, there's one Israeli who dedicated his life to making the argument that it's all because of the Negev, because the Egyptians were yes. obsessed about taking the Negev back or at least cutting through the it. Triangle. So, the triangle. The so triangle. Mm. And, and, and uh, all of a sudden, Israel is there, but it is no longer uh, a hindrance that has, has to be removed in order for the Arab world to to connect. Uh, so I don't see that bridge. Uh, quite quite frankly, it's it's a huge, expensive project within reach of uh, of uh, us. Um, one more incentive to make everybody happy in that. You area. think that there is no That's political that, that is, significance, right. no political uh, uh, religious? Uh, no. I, okay. I think that the wedding of Egypt and Saudi Arabia is absolutely vital mm -hmm. for our long-term interests because, as uh, Amir said, very uh, you know, I, I think it's you put it moderately. Egypt is struggling to keep its nostrils above the murky waters of economic disaster. It is absolutely in our interest, even if it was under Morsi, let alone under a man like Sisi, for Egypt to be economically viable. If Egypt goes belly up on our border, 90 million people, it, it is unimaginable in consequences for the entire Eastern absolutely. Mediterranean. We're actually us. running no, out of no, time. No, no. Um, Saudi Arabia has not the power to push Egypt toward progress and development. Simple. They can help them. They can invest a little bit of money, but not enough, absolutely not. And Sisi itself said it a few times. Really? Don't rely on Saudi Arabia. We need no, no. to, to, to Europe, go for technology for America. the West, for Europe, for the United States. Ambassador Mavel, we're United running States. out Don't of time. Uh, <laughs> in one sentence, how do you see Egypt work through this in the near future? For the time being, for the time being, it's going to continue like it is. Egypt, uh, Sisi will strive to push forward the, um, uh, the economy of Egypt and is doing very well. It's not enough. It's just not enough because it's complicated, it's difficult. You have 50% of illiterate, whatever you want. There is no initiative like in Israel, in such an Arab country, Islamic country. Human beings, human rights are not very good, but well. You know, yesterday, uh, yeah, François Hollande was there. <laughs> and he told him something about, to Sisi about human rights. And he said, listen, Mr. President, we are in the Middle East. Things are completely different. Don't judge us as you judge Europe, okay? Mm -hmm. So it will continue. There will be a lot of problem. And who knows what's going to be in the next three or four years. Dr. Oleman, one sentence? Just that I would very much hope that Italy and Egypt can patch it up because we have an interest in their relationship as well in many ways. Uh, I agree entirely. Egypt's future is in a strong connection with uh, economies of the future, the economies of the West, mm -hmm. not with Saudi Arabia. But for the uh, immediate period, this is very important for us. Last sentence. You are running a democratic show here. It's two against one. We won. <laughs> <laughs> you say. Uh, Ambassador Tsimazer, thank you so very much for being here. Dr. Eran Lerman, thank you so very much for coming here. Mr. Let's Amir have, Oren, it's been a pleasure. Let us within six months and then we see. <laughs> we hope it will change to the better. I'd like to thank our viewers and we will see you next week. You just watched Jerusalem Studio. If you were enriched by the program, please consider supporting Heaven TV 7 Jerusalem. Call us at 0600 10077 or send your donation using the bank account reference number on the screen. You can also donate via PayPal. Jerusalem Studio is made possible by your donation.